in chapter 12, we saw the great man, Abram, nearly fall at the first hurdle of testing and temptation when he went down to Egypt, nearly destroying his own destiny and losing his calling, but not quite, and God was with him. Now he comes back from that near disaster and finds his way to faith and obedience again. But chapter 13 will show us it is costly obedience. Genesis chapter 13 at verse 1. So Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot with him into the Negev, south of the land. Now Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver and in gold. And of course we now know how he was enriched by Pharaoh, as we saw in the last chapter. Verse 13 And he journeyed on from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai to the place where he had made an altar at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. And Lot who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle. At that time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites dwelt in the land. Then Abram said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me, and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I will go to the right, or if you take the right hand, Then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zohar. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So, Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, while Lot dwelt among the cities of the valley, and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which you see, I will give to you and to your descendants forever. I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your descendants also can be counted. Arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. So Abram moved his tent and came and dwelt by the oaks of Mamre, which are at Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord.
This is God's Word. A parting of the ways. Abram and Lot separate. But before we even begin to look at the text of the chapter, let's deal with something fundamental. Something that is ever present in the record of Abram's life. Something that sooner or later we must face and deal with. Now, it's something which is obvious and simple, but it has profound implications for you and for me. And it also asks a direct question of us, if a sometimes disturbing question. And it's this. It becomes clear by now that Abram's life was a journey that the whole of Abram's life was a journey. Now you say, obviously. Yes, obviously. But I want to pause with you and spell that out just a little. The whole story of Abram, the story of his life, is that of a journey. A journey that only came to an end when his life on this earth ended. Abram's life and Abram's story is one journey. A journey with God and in another sense a journey to God. Now, on that journey... Abram sometimes moved on with breathtaking speed. But at other times he slowed down and almost got stuck and had to be moved and shaken by God into action. On that journey, Abram sometimes found and kept the path almost, it seems, unerringly. But at other times, he faltered and he even wandered. And on that journey, he sometimes pressed on with a glad heart. But at other times, he had to persevere through sadness and in fear. But his whole life was a journey. And because of that, it was a life with a goal and a life with purpose. Above all, it was a life lived according to the New Testament record in faith. Faith in God and in God's promises to him. And that life is set down in Scripture for us. The life of Abram stands as a marker for what the life of faith should be. A journey from first to last. A pilgrimage with God and a pilgrimage in another sense to God. And whatever else the life of Abram was, and whatever else it contained, it is stamped with the unmistakable mark of a man who was going someplace. He was called by God, and he was accompanied by the God who called him a friend so that his life was lived with purpose, with a sense of direction, and with direction as it should be for you, for me. There are few things more sad to see than a Christian 
who has lost his or her way. A Christian who has lost their sense of call. And because of that, lost also all sense of direction and purpose. There is nothing more sad than a Christian who has lost the vision. Not a vision of where they are going, but a vision of Christ Himself. So that they are not sure what they are doing with their lives. And they don't know why they are doing it. Christians who appear as if they've somehow slipped out of the stream into a still pool and got stuck there and are going nowhere. That is not how it should be. And the life of Abram speaks this message to us over and over again. That is not how it should be for you and for me. It is not how God means it to be for you. Because your life and mine should be a journey. Therefore, a life lived with a goal and a purpose. And above all, a life lived in faith. So that your journey and your life on this earth should only end together. Think of it. This journey and our life are one, ending only in our home coming to God. And I suspect that's not an end, but only the real beginning, when the utterly joyful and never-ending journey begins. But now we're beginning to speculate. Now, like Abram, sometimes you will move on. Sometimes you will move on at speed and all will seem well. But surely there will be other times when events, circumstances, problems slow you down and almost stop you so that like Abram, you need to be moved and shaken into action. And to going on, like Abram, as we said. Sometimes it will seem easy for you to find and keep the path, almost as if it were an instinctive thing. Unerringly, you are in the center of God's will. But at other times, you will seem to falter and perhaps even wander. And yes, like Abram, Sometimes you will be pressing on with a glad and light heart. But without a doubt, there will be other times when you must persevere through sadness and perhaps in fear. But, and nevertheless, we go on by grace through faith. Is that what your life is like? I assure you that for all your consciousness of your weakness and for all the times that you think that your life is not an important one and has no real significance, I assure you with all my heart that it does and it is. And your life is to be lived with a sense of your call, therefore a sense of direction and purpose. Yes, every Christian life And we must never forget what Jesus says about the last and the least being first and greatest in the kingdom. So that every Christian life, no matter how insignificant it may seem in the eyes of others, and even sometimes in our own eyes, is marked with the significance of one on a journey. And having drawn that to your attention, we can turn again to chapter 13 to find there another element in Abram's life journey. 
And it is another element which was always present in that life journey. And I mean the test of obedience. Now, when we speak of the test of faith or the test of obedience in Abram's life, we automatically think of chapter 22 and the offering up of Isaac. But you never need to turn to chapter 22 to find Abram being tested. All throughout his life and his journey, he was tested. And there are two things that we need to be clear about as we begin to think of this testing. The first is this, that it's not what it seems. What does it seem to be? Well, doesn't it seem at first to be a test against the temptation to self-fulfillment, to ambition, to greed? Isn't it at first apparent that this is something to do with the lure of the cities of the plain and the fertile Jordan Valley as it was at that time and has never been since at that part? That's what it seems at first, but more deeply than that, it is another kind of test. It is a test concerning the temptation to self-assertion. Put it simply, and we see that Abram had to choose here between humility and self-assertion. The other thing we need to be clear about is that while this was a test of character, it was not only a test of character. It was also a test of faithfulness to his call. Hence, his return to Bethel. You see, Abram had to set, again he had to set, what seemed to be true according to the evidence of his eyes, against what he knew by faith to be true, according to the word and the promise of God. Now, I mean by that, that the land seemed to have failed him again. Look at verse 6. The land could not support them both. And what do I mean again? Look back to verse 10 of chapter 12. There was a famine in the land, so Abram went off down to Egypt. The land seemed to have failed him again. And surely Abram must have considered the possibility that this is something now that would go on happening. This would be a constantly recurring nightmare. Therefore, surely it must also have occurred to him that in human terms, in wisdom, he must abandon the land for a more fertile place, a safer place to be. And since he was senior to Lot, and he was the one called by God, should he not be the one to make the move into this better place? That's the evidence of his eyes. But he's just been taught a profoundly valuable lesson through his experience of near failure in Egypt, and so he proceeds at last on the evidence of faith alone. He rises from the error of near disaster in Egypt to the high ground of faith and obedience. And that faith is confirmed by his returning to Bethel, verses 3 and 4. Now here is the significance of Bethel. Bethel was the place of obedience. In his encampment between Bethel and Ai, he consecrated himself to God and called upon the name of the Lord. And he goes back to Bethel surely to renew that consecration and to put his lapse in Egypt behind him. And he does not go back to Shechem, the Shechem we find in chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. 
He does not go back to Shechem because what he does not need at this point is the renewal of a wonderful experience. Now, at Shechem, he had a great experience of God. God appeared to him there and met with him there. But Shechem was not the place of obedience. Bethel was. Oh, in our day and generation, as much as in any other, and perhaps more than in many, Christians are being tempted to keep going back to try and renew wonderful experiences of God, experiences of the Spirit of God, which must not be done if we are avoiding going back to consecration and to renew our dedication and discipleship to God. Is this not why? In so many quarters where the stress is put on great experiences, there is a distinct shortage of obedience, consecration, and a hungering for holiness. Bethel. Not Shechem. And the test comes after the renewing, as it so often does. Is that not your experience? That in the Christian life, tests come to us right after, almost simultaneously with decisions and commitments and re-consecrations to God and His service. When we try to take a step into true and truer, deep and deeper discipleship, it seems that the temptation is there. And the devil at our elbow saying, don't do that, that's too hard a way. Is that not why when Jesus decided that it was time to begin His public ministry, which would inevitably lead to the cross, that the devil was then at his elbow, testing his resolution, his obedience, and his love of the Father. Abram is tested at the point where he makes an act of dedication to God. Back to Bethel, and he is tempted. And he rises to the occasion. Abram was a wise man. The evidence is that he was a very knowing man, and he would surely know that Lot would choose the obvious, sensible, southern Jordan Valley, and yet he gave his nephew the choice. This is obedience to God. It is obedience to God with humility before others. Further, It is obedience at the cost of humility, if not humiliation. Because Lot must have surely thought in his heart that the old man was a fool. But this was the wisdom of God. And it was an act of true peacemaking. And above all, it was faith in action. In fact, it was another kind of renewal. And I mean by that, that Abram had already left home and family and everything to obey obey the call of God. When he left Haran, he renounced everything. And he does it again. He gives his nephew the choice. Oh, it can be hard. Taking this path is undoubtedly the costly way. Because at this point, all pride and false dignity and all thought of self must have died in Abram. But is this not the way Christ would have us obey Him? There are times when we have to eat the humble pie of appearing to be soft and foolish before others. As Hebrews puts it, to accept the plundering of our goods, and that's hard. And we have to do it to see that our journey 
And our destiny is one that goes through low doors where we have to bow, where, like Abram, we have to be thought little of by others to play the second fiddle like Barnabas and to leave God to vindicate if and as and when he chooses. It's hard, but it's the way. There's an awful lot more talk about humility amongst Christians than there is action. Oh, it's easy to talk with a pious voice and a tremor about humility. But talk is cheap. Humility is costly. It's a matter of obedience. Not doing what you want to do. Not doing what will lift you up in the eyes of others. Not doing that which is self, but that which is for Christ. But God does vindicate his obedient servant. You know what happens. As the story unfolds, Lot declines. He declines both materially and morally, but Abram is blessed. What Lot finds in the fertile valley is corruption and then insecurity and then strife in Sodom. And what Abram finds by stepping out into what seems to be a land that cannot support him is peace and liberty through renewed obedience. Of course he does, because he is now in the land. Because he is now once more in the center of the will of God for him because he is on the intended path of his life's journey, as we said at the beginning. And you'll notice verse 14 says that all this came to him after Lot had separated from him. There are some painful separations. There are some sore partings of the way in our lives that are the door into peace and progress and blessing. And if they are painful, they are better done soon, are they not? So Abram knows renewed blessing and renewed promises through renewed obedience. And God says to him, lift up your eyes, look around you. Look south and north and east and west. All the land you see I will give you. And then to that he adds the wonderful promise to your descendants forever, to this childless man for whom this is going to become the big issue in his life for many years, to your descendants forever, so that your descendants shall be like the dust of the earth, which if, they, if it can be numbered, so can your descendants. And he says to Abram, Arise and walk through the length and breadth of the land, because I will give it to you. Notice that repeated word, give. I will give this to you. As our life and our salvation and our inheritance in Christ, our glorious destiny, as the children of God, is a gift of God and no less and no other. Abram handed the decision over to Lot, knowing what would happen, surely, but knowing that nevertheless they were both in God's hands. Derek Kidner in his little commentary calls this a blind choice, but if it's a blind choice, then it was rewarded with sight. Lift up your eyes, God says. Look around you. So that believing was followed by blessing. Isn't it always? Oh friends, it is for us, although sometimes this obedience of faith seems like making blind choices. It seems like trusting in darkness. But blessedness, inevitably, irresistibly, And eventually, blessedness follows on from obedience because God is not in debt to us. He is not. 
من stetter. So Abram comes to Hebron. To the oaks of Mamre. To the place nearby which both Sarah and he one day will be buried. And he settles in the land which according to the promise of God is his. His in the promise and the purpose of God, but never his literally in life, so that all his life will be a life of faith and a never-ending journey. And notice how the chapter closes, telling us again that this was a man who moved tents. And the only thing he built were altars. And what does an altar speak of? An altar speaks of sacrifice. An altar speaks of consecration through sacrifice. And all altars speak ultimately of the consecrated sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He moved his tent and he built the altar. And in his consecration to God, his life reflects the consecrated sacrifice of his great descendant, Jesus Christ, our Savior. This is the Christian life, a journey. A lifelong journey until our homecoming, until that day which will dawn bright and clear when the morning star rises in our hearts and the sun of righteousness will rise and never set. A journey. A journey let us never hide it from each other, always with its testing. And always requiring of us obedience. And often a costly obedience that will involve humility. Not talked of, but acted out. Humility and trust. But a journey, finally, that we never make alone. There is one with us always, the one who only made a perfect journey through life and who gave that perfect life for us so that not one of us should be alone. It would be tragic if we were to live Aimless, pointless, purposeless, goalless existences. And it's only if we get stuck in the world like Lot that that is the case. We are meant to be like Abram with Christ on a journey. Moving tent and building altars in our lives to reflect the sacrifice made for us for the forgiveness of our sins, for our eternal destiny and light by Jesus. Let us pray.